Hello, Heron. So I have a bunch of questions, including some listener-submitted questions. But why don't you kick things off? Do you have anything you want to chat about? Well, I've got a whole list of things, actually. Very I don't know good. if I want to talk about all of them or not. Uh, Nothing like three weeks off in order to get both of yeah, our lists overflowing. Yeah, yeah. Who the hell is Alex Brooks? So Alex Brooks... Well, I wasn't actually going to use his name in the podcast, but since you've used his name in the podcast, he is um, someone who has featured in a number of the previous Stone Eight recordings, including The Trail of Blood and various other recordings. He was a childhood friend of mine ah. who also features in a lot of my writing and some of my thinking. And, he's and what was he the, doing at your place? He's probably one of the few people, and I should say this, let me say how, well, let me say this. He's probably one of the few people who could turn up here without a departure date and stick around for the length of time that he stuck around. So <laughs> he, I guess he'd finished a college degree and he decided that he needed to take a year off traveling. He's got some work that he's doing back in Australia, but it doesn't really force him to be in Australia. So yeah, he, he got on a plane and turned up here just before the start of December. <laughs> did you get a warning or did he no, just he show me, up? He on... called me, well, he called me, he's, he basically gave me a six month warning, a one month warning and a three day oh, warning. Wow. Well, what more could you ask for? He, well, yeah. He, I don't know. He's never really warned me that he would stop by like he's warned me recently. He's talked about coming to the US before. So at the six-month warning, I was kind of like, yeah, if you're sharp, you're sharp. Yeah. At the one-month warning, it was like, yeah, you should probably buy a map, and you should probably see LA. And at the one-day warning, it was like, yeah, I'm probably going to be coming, and I'll spend a few, you know, a few days in LA, and I've got friends in LA to catch up with. What happened was he, his plane landed, he looked out at LA, and decided almost immediately that he needed to come up here, and he stayed <laughs> up here for, like I say, two and a half weeks. Or m m oh, yeah, he, oh really? He was there that period. long? Yeah. Wow. He spent a couple of days in San Francisco during the storm of the century, uh, but aside from that, yeah, he was here the whole time. Wait, it sure fizzled out down here. It, was it a big deal up there, the storm? No. Yeah. It was, it was called it was... the storm of the century, but in actuality... Um, I mean, it was heavy rain, and we haven't seen oh, for heavy a rain for you yeah. know a few years. But yeah. it was, it was yeah, like, it, was a, it rained exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's called rain. Yes, <laughs> yeah. So that's who Alex Brooks is. Our listener, oh, okay. Rich Murphy. Where is he now? Um, he's now in Upper New York State somewhere. He has a he has a college friend who's in somewhere in Upper New York State near Rochester, and that's where he is. He got on a train here and did the three-day train travel oh, to must, upstate New York. He must be having a ball. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think he certainly had a number of luxuries in this trip that, uh, I mean, I was hoping to take time off work, but unfortunately I couldn't take any time off work. So we had to force... Well, he had a place... It. Listen, you gave him a roof over his head so he could do what he wanted to do for a while. What yeah, more we, ask? yeah, we yeah. have good Wi-Fi. We've got plenty of reading material. He certainly... Uh, you know, he certainly made the most out of staying at Shea Park. And you have an a, a extra room? Yeah, we have an extra room. We have a guest yeah. room. We oh, also, that's perfect. Yeah, that's we have awesome. my study as well that we can break yeah. into an additional room if we have multiple guests. Yeah, but no, no, but he, he wanted, that's your room. Anyway, no, <laughs> so he, he basically lived out of the guest bedroom. He yeah. made himself perfectly comfortable, and he enjoyed his time here. Great. And you're friends with him on Facebook too, aren't you? Oh, I don't know. Probably. I, I you know, I, I don't think of Facebook as a place for actual <laughs> friends. I mean, well, I anyway, do have friends there. You but... get his photo feed of bad photos of Tom. Uh, um, perhaps. I don't yes. know. Anyway. I'm, I'm not following him anyway, I, I don't think. You know, I don't even really know. I don't pay that much attention to, again, I post stuff there all the time. Yeah. And I and I look at it occasionally, yeah. but uh, not all that much. Anyway, okay, so well, that's, that's, okay, that's, that's number one. I guess that could lead me into the next topic, which is about the idea of living alone, mm. and which I've done for years and years and years. Mm. And... Um, really like it and and i i was thinking the other day about how i think i began it's hard for me to really figure out what's going on for most people but apparently in most people um, it, their lives they they live in a kind of cloud of language that's generated by other people that there's always 
I mean, even when they're quiet, just the fact of other people being around and the, and the different narratives that they mm-hmm. have, that the space itself becomes colored by a sort of cloud of language. I don't know how else to say it, a miasma, but that's... <laughs> That's going, a little, that's going a little far. Yes. But but um but that when you live alone and you don't have a TV and you don't have I mean I do watch movies and I do watch YouTube and I do you know have other language coming at me on occasion. For the most part I live in a in a universe where the only language that's shown up is what's coming out of my own language machine. Hmm. And I'm thinking, you know, that's really significantly different than the way most people live. That may partly account for why I'm as odd as I am. <laughs> well, it's also to do with your own pathology associated with language. Um, I mean, you could be you could be more emphatic associated with the importance of that. I think what interests me, because I do agree with you partially, but we all, irrespective of the environments that we live in, irrespective of the things that surround us, although you're right, it's possible to live in an environment where the language of others is more extreme, one does occasionally share one's own thoughts, so to speak, in circumstances even like this. I mean, you spend a portion of your week with people oh, in oh, your yeah. work environment. Yeah, I spend and... uh, maybe 10, 15 hours mm. or more, maybe 15 hours a week. And then I go to the store and, and I talk to the landlord occasionally, but that that really is insignificant almost compared to i th- well i'm assuming i again i don't know I'm, uh, that the way most people live they are sort of steeped in language most of the time it is interesting because certainly i found while having alex here and now you've named him i can name him as well well you've he's... named him on your page I yes mean... i guess i mean people could find that out but anyway i do appreciate that because i think certainly having another person here and alex is very I mean, really, it's somewhat disappointing that you and he couldn't talk, but I don't think you could actually get a word in edgeways if you did talk, so it might not have been a productive conversation. But Alex is very language-dominant, and certainly I found, having him here, that sometimes I would have to just go to bed early in order to, as you say, have my own period of my own, you know, what have you. But certainly in terms of my productivity, not just with these recordings, on almost every aspect, it was very difficult... For me to do my own thing when I had someone here who, you know, wanted conscious, active participation through every waking hour in his presence. Right. And even if they don't, the fact mm. that you know they are there and you know who mm. they are and what their expectations are and all of that. Well, that's just interesting the... because I think what it made me reflect on, and certainly I've had this discussion with my spiritual advisor both while Alex was here and also after his departure is my spiritual advisor and I give each other a certain degree of space in this regard. I mean, in order for me to do the stuff that I do, but also I have a number of projects that take a certain amount of time, and she has a number of projects that take a certain Ah, amount of time. And this... So you guys are weirdos. You actually have a life, independent. Of one another. (laughs) Yeah, you have your own projects. Yeah. I think that, do you think that's rare? I, oh, no, I, without I, question. I, I, the more that I realize that I have these projects that I work on and, uh, you know, fulfill certain aspects of my life, I realize that not only am I in a vast minority, that most people actually live their lives just, you know, not even caring about this kind of stuff. Well, no, they don't, these issues, no, they just want to get a new car. The winter solstice. Mm. Is, about, is about to be upon us yes. Sunday, and uh, for many years I I've gone to the desert on the winter solstice and spent for the night the out there. Years but for the past talking. several years, yeah. I have not gone. Yeah. Um, it's it was snowing one year and it was raining one year, and then I found some other excuses not to go yes. on You've some become other. Become a creature years. of comfort in recent years. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm going this year. Very good. Cool. And uh, I I've. I've actually got a checklist. I found it. I was surprised it was still on my computer from 20 years ago. But <laughs> I have a checklist of things to bring with me so I don't discover that I'm missing something when I'm there. Mm. And um, so anyway, everything is ready to go. Uh, the car is ready to go tomorrow morning about, well, whenever I feel like it, I'm going to leave in the morning after I get up and exercise. Mm-hmm. And spend the night out there. But it's an especially auspicious 
uh, year. When I started my calendar uh, 29 years ago or 20 whatever, <laughs> I don't even know, <laughs> um, I was looking for uh, some significant uh, physical event in the universe to, to, uh, to start the calendar. And it seemed like the obvious thing would be the beginning of a new, a, a new moon on the day of the new year, on the solstice. And so I bought a, an ephemeris. And, of course, uh, during the entire century from 1900 to 2000, there was not a single occurrence or coincidence of a new moon on the uh, winter solstice, mm. which is quite odd because it's just, it's, it's, it should happen about once every 29 or 30 years, Certainly. you know, on the average, but it didn't. However, and so, we, we, fuck with the, we fuck with the dates, Heron, and I think we probably fuck with the dates in such a way that that would be highly, that is actually what we're optimizing against as we kind of do our quarter day, you know, jimmying associated with aligning so, I mean, my understanding, actually, of the way we're adding the quarters and what have you, and, you know, leap years and all this yeah. kind of good oh, stuff. Is well, we there are three or four is... different methods going on, actually. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're doing leap seconds. I yes. mean, so, I mean, yeah. It depends on which system you subscribe to. But in any case, I'm just going by the ephemeris and the positions mm -hmm. and the occurrence of the new moon and uh, the moment, you know, or during the day, you know, both during the same 24-hour period from midnight to midnight in California. Now, somewhere else in the world, there may have been an occurrence. Of, I mean, because it depends on where you are at what time, because it can push it one way or another into the next day or not. So um, I'm just talking about California. Mm. <laughs> so, But in any case, um, that's what's happening this Sunday. This is the first time in at least, I don't know what happened before 1900, but in at least 114 years, uh, this is the first time there's been an occurrence of a new moon and the winter solstice on the same day in mm. California. So I, I can't not go. So are you sleeping <laughs> in a tent or are you sleeping in your car? I'm sleeping on the ground without it. I don't need a tent. If okay. it doesn't rain, I mean, I've got a good sleeping bag. Okay. So I'm plenty warm. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I just, I, I, it's really simple. I'm going to stop in Joshua Tree when I get out there and buy a bunch of wood for a fire. And, um, and then I'm going to build a hell of a big fire <laughs> that'll last until 10 or 11 o'clock. And, and then I'll just go to sleep and look up at, and there's a, actually, there's a iridium flare out there. I don't, I don't remember what time, but I'm going to be looking for that. Mm. <laughs> it's not a particularly bright one. But out there, a 5.3 or minus 5.3 is maybe very different from here in the city. You know, exactly. it would be interesting to see if it's impressive or not, you know. Yes. Yeah, my in-laws live out that way. And unfortunately, they still have a number of houses within a... I don't know. I mean, they're on a, they're on. Where are they? Morongo Valley or uh, um, Yucca Valley or? They're in Phelan. Okay, I don't know where that is. Uh, That's which further is, south, I guess. It's well, it's probably more westward. I think probably more northwest actually um, than you will be. Okay. Well, whatever. <laughs> but yeah, they, they still have a sufficient. It's very difficult actually to find areas that aren't light polluted by humans, even in that part of the world. So. Well, yeah. Well, you have to. Well, if there's a community, then you're. <laughs> that's what you got. Well, no. The point oh. is not that there's a community, that but there are still a sufficient number of isolated houses spread sufficiently. Oh, on the for, on the edges of that, yeah. Mm. You can get as well. You can get as far out as you want to get. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you want want to get that far out. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the director of the gallery uh, that was showing my stuff apparently has a place out in uh, Joshua Tree or somewhere out there, I think. Mm. The crazy lady. Mm. I, it just set me to thinking about all these various crazy people out there, these language monkeys. It'd be really interesting to hear what her monologue is. Well, I was going to talk about that. Yeah. I was going to talk about that in a kind of extended form. Okay, well, uh, you want to let it go then for now? Uh, I'll we'll just... return to it. Yeah, okay, we'll yeah, good, okay. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, uh, yeah, about m 
my memory i've always i've always sort of felt bad about my memory mm. or embarrassed about it mm. i mean it's, it's always been an issue i could never remember people's names or mm. you know all sorts of shit and i read something somewhere along the line many years ago that you know you actually have to pay attention <laughs> to get it into memory you know mm. you have to actually want to mem- remember it if yeah, you don't no, want to I mean, remember it you, i find oh. your memory for a lot of things perfectly fine Oh, it's, I find it's, your memory it's, associated with our conversations particularly poor, but for things that are really very well, that's important what I want. You. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Is that, and I think this is not unrelated to this idea of living alone and having mostly only input from myself or very selected mm. other linguistic inputs. Mm. I have very little random linguistic input into my system. Mm. You know, I, I do two days a week at work. I hear a bunch of shit that has nothing to do with anything <laughs> and you know but uh the rest of my life uh it just doesn't work that way but like you said my memory is fine in all sorts of things like all the technical stuff that i read and, and the stuff well, that's that, extraordinary that, associated with 19th century american authors i mean you have an amazing an eclectic well, memory I, associated I've, I've with got a, a fine memory for certain kinds of things yeah. and and what i realize is that uh that I just sort of assume that most stuff that I come into is worthless. Mm. And, and I'm, and I may ask questions and stuff, but the fact is I actually don't care. Yeah. No, you know, I, about- I, I mean, I hear that in a lot of our conversations, yeah. actually, Heron. And when we return to topics and you see them afresh, I think, yeah. okay, so this is obviously something that Heron didn't remember through there. And I wonder yeah. actually if our poor long suffering listeners, Kind of say, why is Tom telling the same story that he told only three or four recordings ago? And yeah. Heron is looking at it in a completely yeah. different light. Of Frank, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're right. Well, and then and so now I'm looking at that phenomena and trying to figure out whether that's something I should change or whether or not it actually serves me. And it may be a problem for other people, but the more I look at it, the more I think is, yeah, you know, if something becomes important, like uh, Alex Brooks, apparently we've talked about him before. Apparently. Uh, and, um, you know, and it was interesting at the time, I'm sure, but it has almost nothing to do with me. Yeah, no, <laughs> you know? I mean, so, no, most of our conversations don't have anything to do with you. No, of course not. And so that kind of stuff just doesn't stay in yeah. my memory. Anything like that until it comes up. You know, I guess if Alex Brooks became a thing somehow and actually became part of my life one way or another, or just because we talk about him every every show from now on or whatever, yeah. you know, then then it will become part of my memory. Yeah. But uh, most stuff, and I'm thinking actually that's probably not a bad thing for me, given the choices I've made and the situation I'm yeah. in. That. Uh, it really allows me to be sort of uncluttered by all sorts of shit that's totally irrelevant. Well, and if it becomes relevant, yeah. then fine, then it'll become relevant. The but- interesting the interesting interactions that we've had have oftentimes been framed about the very rare occasions, and I'm thinking over a hundred recordings, maybe two occasions, <laughs> where you've gone back and listened to the previous recording. And then oh, that makes all- well, of course, that changes the whole game. And... I wonder if you could invest, potentially, maybe the two or so hours per week uh-huh, and listen to the previous it. recording, huh? because oftentimes you will raise exactly the same topics again. You might make a slightly <laughs> different spin on it, but some of these topics I just think are, are kind of worn out in the first telling, and when we return to them, yeah. although oftentimes I do humour you, um, you know, <laughs> it, it is kind of curious because you do come at it as if you've never had this conversation yeah. with me previously. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, and I, and that's like I said, this is what's led me to examine this and yeah. try to figure out what's going on here because I don't think I have a bad, well, I, yeah, do I have a bad memory? No, I've got a very selective memory, though, mm. <laughs> you know, and, uh, well, it's just interesting. I'm not quite sure whether or if or if I can or whether I should, uh, change it. You know, it's something that I've pondered on in terms of our interaction because I have other interactions with people where they pick up certain elements of my interaction with them, but they don't have a relatively coherent view of our interactions. Yeah. And in your case, even though we interact typically, although the past three weeks haven't been typical, on a one week or one or every other week basis, uh, it would it does make me wonder if you could 
give a kind of summary of any number of my thoughts on any number of topics at any given time. My suspicion mm-hmm. is you probably can't. Um, you know, you you may be right because actually I haven't categorized you. Mm. Uh, I'm I mean, just a you, voice you stri- that approaches you. Well, every- no, you strike me as someone. I mean, I have certain opinions about the way you react to a lot of things, Certainly. but uh, I don't think they're all that predictable. Exactly, and that's uh, the way I live my life. Well, yeah, I mean, that would seem to, but that that's what you'd expect from anyone who's paying any attention. <laughs> you hope so. so. Well, I mean, the idea of being a flip-flopper, I think, is really very critical. You've got to change your mind almost continuously. Well, of course, that whole yeah. idea, oh, they change their mind. <laughs> Heaven forbid. <laughs> oh, no. How are we on your list of topics? Oh, well, let me see. Uh, we're getting close to the end very here. Very good. No, I think we are, as long as we come back to the crazy lady stuff. Very good. Well, uh, I'll, I'll f- filter happy. that into the first... Well, what I wanted to say is that this may be... Having gotten this far, folks, having run this gauntlet of parent topics, <laughs> this may be the first recording that people listen to having come from... I almost want to do something. I'm going to use your pronunciation just to humor you here. The Drunken Taoist Podcast. They are running nominally... A thirty-second bit associated with Stone Ape. <laughs> I paid a certain amount of money for this bit. I don't know whether the drunken Taoist listenership are going to be flocking to. What this. is if the bit? Are, Where can we hear? There's a it's an audio thing or they're what? They're doing it. They're ad living it. I doubt they've even. Well, they might have listened to Stone Ape. Who knows? Uh, but you wrote. No, no, I didn't write. I, I I told them this is what Stone Ape is. Put it together in your own words. <laughs> Have you heard it? No, it's not. It's, I'll hear it as soon as it comes out. Okay, good. I'm, I'm anxious. Yeah, this is we'll part post of an it experiment. to the, post it to the, uh, the <laughs> yeah. Stone Age Heaven forbid that you have yeah. to listen to anything, Aaron. I will, I will condense it down and uh, maybe even present it at the start of the next recording. <laughs> anyway, so, norm- I mean, I'm wondering, because when you pay a certain amount of money for a certain thing, you... I don't well, really well, have... Tell, let me get the background of this. Mm-hmm. You paid how much for what? I paid $300 for 30 seconds. For 30 seconds? One time? One time. 30 seconds on, on a podcast? Yes. Jesus, that's not bad business if you can sell enough of them. <laughs> well, here's where it gets interesting. So I've done some background research associated with... well. It's interesting because there's a kind of key figure in the podcast and there's a lesser figure who... Wait a minute, I'm still is... hung up. You, <laughs> you, you didn't write a script or anything. They're going to make up something. You don't, they don't know anything about what we do. Who you, knows? They, you paid them 100 bucks. 300. 300 bucks. And, um, and you have no idea what they're going to do? Hear it. Let's decompress this whole thing. <laughs> Because, funnily enough, in the last recording I explained this, but you've completely forgotten all of that, so let's start afresh. (laughs) I was feeling particularly nihilistic one day, looking at podcast statistics, and I thought, let me find a podcast that's somewhat like what Heron and I do. Yeah. And let me throw, cause if they're asking for I me, remember we. I do remember certainly. us talking about the drunken Taoist, yes. Very good. So I don't. I've got a certain rap sheet associated with this podcast. I have a certain sense of the number of likes this individual has on Facebook. I know that this individual... Has He's a single guy. I mean, no, so no, no, there are two guys person. talking. Okay, two guys, okay. Yes. And I also know that this fellow has appeared twice on Joe Rogan's podcast. Okay, so he's got some credit. He's part of a podcast network that I think is mainly circulated by the advertising and sponsors of these particular podcasts. There's a group of podcasts Being based who, out of I LA. I don't understand that. Uh, Let me explain. Say that again. There's a, ba- okay. there's a group of podcasts that are based out of LA that all do the same sponsorship, the same products, and they appear on each other's podcasts. They've effectively created oh, an informal okay. podcast network, a network where they can yeah, share yeah. listeners informally. Yeah. They don't explicitly yeah. talk about it. No, but they're doing it. Yeah, so, got it. yeah. My friend, but what they're a friend, basically just a group of people well, who know each other. And... Who knows? Because this is where it gets very interesting. They are certainly not as candid as I am being here, particularly associated with the flow of money. Who knows how this thing works out? Because they're not <laughs> certainly not candid with it. Yeah. But I was reflecting on Bruce Damer's appearance on Joe Rogan and my conversation with Bruce Damer following uh, his appearance on Joe Rogan with the view that he'll probably go back to appear on Joe Rogan in the future. But we have this kind of non-verbal, verbal agreement that he's not going to promote any of my stuff and I need to work on 
what my stuff is and promoting it independently of that. Right, yeah. So looking at that and also looking at a kind of mixture of podcast statistics which appear relatively meaningless, we also discussed to some length in the last recording associated with my experience being a relatively young dude coming to the US not having any trouble meeting and greeting a bunch of folks. Now I work a, you know, work a day life and I'm paid a phenomenally good salary for my labor. I actually have money that I could use where previously I ah. used my wit and intelligence. Ah, yeah, no, that. I know exactly what you're talking about. Exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm broaching that same Certainly. territory. Yeah. So I thought, well, let me at least investigate. Yeah. I did approach one of his other friends, a fellow by the name of Duncan Trussell, who's a comedian. I, I th- I'm just disturbed that you that you didn't write a script or tell oh, but this or is, look, this is have your, some control this over is your what the pathology. fuck you're say. This yeah. is your pathology right. here and embodied yeah. in your concerns. Yeah, well, okay. I don't have those concerns. Because well, my you don't is, care what they say. Look, there, there's the one, and this I'm going to put out to the drunk and Dallas listeners that no doubt by this point are completely disgusted <laughs> are flowing by flowing into our, our listening. Welcome, my fellow drunken Taoists. Yes, you are the drunken Taoist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you are him. I am. I am. You look it up in the dictionary, it's me. Yes, there's just a picture of Aaron Stone. Wine glass in hand. Through this... I thought, I'm never going to actually establish what this network means. This network's not going to interact with me, irrespective of, you know, the things that I do. Yeah. So why not just throw down some cash and see what actually happens? See what happens, yeah. Now, this is important for the drunken Taoist listeners, because if you want me to keep throwing down cash, you need to identify that you've actually come here and heard ah, this recording, yes. and that this was yeah. a productive thing. Because yeah. if I don't get a sense yeah. of that, I'm not going to be paying next month or the month yeah, after right. or the month following. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So if you are a drunken Taoist, let us know. Yeah, listener. If you're a drunken Taoist as well, um, you and Heron can prize fight at some event soon to be determined. But let's move <laughs> on from that. So anyway, the folks who are new coming to this recording, what happens is typically every Friday night or every other Friday night, Heron and I sit down and rap on a variety of different topics. And because I'm a polite, gentle person, I allow Heron to rap on his topics first, and then we come in with my topics. So this is the transition, which if you've listened this far, this is where it is. Anyway, so if you're coming in new to this podcast, I live in a part of the US, San Jose, California, that has the lowest density of police to anywhere in the US. <laughs> And this lowest creates, density of pl- you're talking about the ratio of police to community uh, yes. members. Yes, <laughs> and this creates a number of really interesting examples. or suspects as maybe a better <laughs> better name. Yeah, we're all suspects. <laughs> so anyway, historically, I've had a relatively negative narrative associated with this, and I was feeling somewhat flummoxed by the whole experience, particularly when my friend Alex Brooks arrived. And I was working through the week and I wasn't able to take off time in order to spend it with my friend. And I went out for lunch as I do on a Friday typically uh, because I work from home. And work when I work from home, it just means that I'm completely consumed with work, but in my home. So I went out for uh, lunch and I realized sitting next to me after about five minutes was either a traffic inspector or a San Jose police officer. I didn't want to like totally squiz at the guy so i just kept eating my foe quite comfortably and then when i'd finished my foe i looked over i saw it was a san jose policeman and i said excuse me sir do you mind if i pay for your lunch because i really appreciate the work that you do in this community and i'm a local resident and he kind of grunted he didn't say he wanted didn't want it he didn't say it didn't matter he didn't shoot out his hand And I went and paid for his dinner and I left, or lunch and I left. And actually, just before I made this offer to him, a bunch of other policemen entered, but I decided already that I was going to pay just for this gentleman. (laughs) That's right, starting to get expensive. (laughs) And what I did, what I was realizing in this circumstance was irrespective of my general negative narrative associated with the non existent police force here, I need to basically do remedial interactions. Yeah, support, yeah, right. In you order want, to yeah. identify that this community isn't just a bunch of homeless people. Because yeah. the reason that there were so many police here was because they were removing the local homeless encampment that actually houses about 300 homeless people. And my friend Alex Brooks came and took video footage of the um, 
conclusion of this, including a Buddhist monk, funnily enough, who was uh, wandering around being interviewed by the local television <laughs> station. <laughs> so this frames the area in which I live. <laughs> You can't make this stuff up, Heron. It just happens. <laughs> Shit happens, yeah. So we've moved forward to the event that Heron wants me to talk about. It, through the storm. Uh, which, what the hell is that? I don't even remember anymore. Let me, well, I'll introduce that and we can just get on with that. But, so through the storm, things got wet. And my spiritual advisor, who for folks who are listening in for the first time, is what I refer to my wife on this podcast as being. But my spiritual advisor had wet shoes, and she decided to put her shoes out because they were wet. <laughs> she didn't want to bring them in the house. They were out for a period uh, of her. three days, <laughs> and then coincidentally, on the morning that my friend Alex Brooks left for New York State, the shoes disappeared. Ah, so he, so he might have stolen There was some initial speculation bastard. that he might have accidentally taken them because we were all bleary-eyed first thing in the morning. He had to get to the train station. Yeah, they could have been grabbed, picked up. Yeah. Yeah. However, I should point out that we had a package stolen from us maybe six months ago, and the advice from San Jose Police, because they couldn't do anything about this package theft, even though we had the address that the package thief went into and dropped the package, <laughs> was that we should put up cameras. And from that time, we have installed three separate cameras, uh, one of which, uh, through the week leading into the shoe theft, was pointing out the front window. Is it easy to, uh, to, to, I mean, do you have to put in a large amount of time to find that video, or is it relatively... It's in a YouTube clip. I could, no, I know. I no, my question is: is when you get oh. the idea to search for something, well, here's where it gets can difficult. You do it relatively quickly. It's or easy. You... It's easy if the object is in the camera view. It's considerably more difficult if the object isn't in the camera view. However, we have motion. Well, it's sensors. impossible. No, 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 no. Here's here's what's not impossible. We have motion sensors components of the image. So if someone enters a certain section of the image, it will say doormat. Uh, entry area, these kind of things, because I've already yeah. set up special squares in the camera it? image okay. that identifies well, movement. Very sophisticated. Exactly. How, and this is running on what? On a Mac? It's going into the cloud. It's a cloud system. Okay, so, a so you interact with it with a, a, a website. website? Or an app. Or oh. a number of ones. Okay, interesting. So anyway, my spiritual advisor, because she was a bit upset associated with these stu shoes being stolen, invested, I don't know, some amount of time. I was at work at the time, but she pointed out at, t I can't remember where it was, okay. I think it was 12.30. Okay, so she actually case. went through the yeah. video and found it. Yeah. Found that section where yeah. there was movement and yeah. saw this woman move up onto the... Onto our port. So the, the software the isn't good enough to do that for you. You actually no, have no, to no, go through it. No, no, the software identified that there was motion on the step, and she went back through oh, some okay. of this. Ah, okay, good. Yeah, things, that's what I was this, curious yes, about. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so it's relatively trip. easy. You just exactly. go search for the when, when was there motion exactly. and go and look at it. Exactly. Okay. So oh, I cool. was at work at the time, and she it was. I was having lunch with my coworkers, and I said, "Well, I'm going to go get this footage." And my coworkers looked over my shoulder and saw the woman carrying bags and what appeared to be a Starbucks cup and picking up the shoes and wandering off. And that was Monday night. Uh, no, possibly Tuesday night actually. So I thought, well. Geez, if people are just stealing shoes, why don't I put out a fake Amazon package? Because the Amazon package was the thing that was stolen six months ago. And why yeah. don't I leave just the corner of the Amazon package? Yeah, just out? so you can see it just if you're so looking. You can see yeah. it if you're looking. Yeah. And yeah. then why don't I put the camera on it? And why don't I see how long <laughs> it takes? So, <laughs> so you this, put it out at what time? I put it out at about ten. 10 o'clock in the evening. And I woke up okay. at about 5 in the morning and, uh, you know, somewhat try them out. And thought, well, I'll go get a glass of water. And as I was walking there, because I'm on call currently for work, I always had my work phone in my hand. And as I was getting the water, I thought, well, I could at least check the camera and the package was gone. <laughs> this is 5.30, 5 a.m. 5.30 and 10 5 a.m. So, so the question is, how long did it take for the guy to come by and steal? Let me tell you the story then. So at this point, I then went back and through a process, because the package is a physical thing that shows in the camera, and you can move it as you can with QuickTime editing or yeah. any kind of video editing. Yeah. You can move it backwards and forwards, and you can gravitate to the time period where the package is stolen. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so, here, and now it's not here. So I did that, yeah. and I saw a grainy image of a masked man very swiftly reaching forward and grabbing the package and leaving. Yeah. 
Yeah. And at 5 That was what time? That was uh, 12.07. Okay, two hours. Past, right? Yes, yes, two hours since I put the package out. I should yeah. also point out, in the package <laughs> contained a note. You should note. do this every week. Well, let's get to that. <laughs> in the package contained a note. The note said, congratulations, yeah. you are a YouTube star, and put through the link to my latest YouTube video, <laughs> which would be, funnily enough, this package being stolen. And that was what was in the package. You're brave, you know. Well, You're... this is what caught me at 5 a.m. Because to be perfectly <laughs> frank, to see a fully masked man reaching on and grabbing this package at what I realized was midnight made me realize that perhaps I shouldn't be working out what the criminality is in the neighborhood quite in this fashion. <laughs> perhaps. Um, well, never mind. I'll never go on. Anyway. So what happened, because I then analysed the video, I did contact the local police, they've done nothing, they've not communicated. Of course not, what are they going to do? I joined a, well, here's where it gets interesting, I investigated the nature of this crime. Traditionally, this is a misdemeanour on a package, but by wearing a mask, it becomes a felony (laughs) in California. And the police's claim has always been, well, they're just stealing package, it's only a misdemeanour. No, this is actually a felony. This is what happened. Oh, it's not a real felony. Yeah, it's like, not a like real felony. Yeah, yeah they, they something. need to actually like come in with shotguns before it becomes a real <laughs> felony. But let me return to this. Two guys walking down the street, one at about two and a half paces in front of the first. The first guy stops, he's what I will refer to as the watch, and the second guy moves up to him. They have a brief conversation of which I can hear some of the audio, and then one of them, the one who actually took the package runs back into the shadows and puts on a mask very heavily, a full face mask. Oh, okay, so they've obviously seen... So you shouldn't put a sign out there that says you have a camera. Well, this is where it gets interesting. (laughs) That's right, you don't want to do that. Because you've got a number of factors. My view is actually that the sign is a deterrent for almost everyone except for... The pros. The pros. (laughs) Well, that's the question, is how many of them are pros and how many of them is is the first time? They're probably all pros. This is the question associated with surveying the neighbourhood. I have a a similar stunt package downstairs. Is, which I have <laughs> contemplated putting out. On well, you got one out there right now? No. Just waiting? <laughs> no, I've contemplated... Well, I've got one downstairs. I haven't actually put it out. Oh, well, when are you going to put it out? Well, this is where it enters an interesting problem space. <laughs> so what I've done is I've added a second camera and I've added a higher wattage light globe on the porch. Oh, good, so we get a better picture next exactly. time. Yeah, I'm damn right. However... My feeling is that this, what I have done is, it was to a certain extent unintentionally instigatory, but I have actually, it is. I have actually instigated this circumstance. No, that's right. You started something here. Now, uh, are you prepared to carry through? Well, this is where it gets interesting because my perspective is that the next scenario is something like a brick through the window. Well, that's what I'm thinking is that, uh, yeah, that you've started something that I'm not sure I would have wanted to start. Well, my <laughs> anticipation was that I would just get some teenager giggling with his mates, grabbing the package. I didn't uh, anticipate... No, this is some guy. This is someone who needs this shit. Two. Two people in this case. Well, whatever. There's it, a it, watch and a guy actually getting yeah, the Yeah, and these guys work, and this is how they make their living. Exactly. No, exactly. And there could be multiple people operating like this. Yeah, it's a, there's probably a whole culture of this exactly. out there. Exactly. Yeah, well, these because people live buy, on the edge of this yeah, society. The, you yeah. can't buy the mask that was used on the internet. I've looked for it. This is something that's probably made. There are probably women folk making these masks for these guys. <laughs> well, who knows? It would be interesting to, to find out. It actually, would be absolutely should, next time, why don't you ask them for an interview? Well, I was thinking of actually doing that, but my view is... Ah, that now that would be truly awesome, is uh, to put a note in there telling them that you want to interview them for your podcast <laughs> as part of this subculture that exists on the edge of society. <laughs> The problem here is that they're committing felonies. Well, you do get no, no. So let them go. This would be interesting. This could be really fascinating. I mean, they're all. That's what I was thinking about when I, you know, I talked about the crazy thing. What the hell world do these people live in? What story have they got going in their head to to accomplish all this? Well, you know, the thing that I realized having entered this space. And having realized, and really it's come as well through, I, I'm not alone here. I've 
my spiritual advisor, we own cats. You know, I'm now entering a realm which is so dark and so murky that I don't actually know whether I want to invest psychological well, you need time to into it. Yeah, you seriously. And what I realized yeah. putting out the bait package initially was that I had fallen into this circumstance mm. by not paying attention. Yeah, right. Irrespective of however many evenings yeah. I talk to you, yeah. I put out a package, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, somewhat foolhardy, and yeah. a majority of the people that follow me through Facebook and interact with me through Facebook consider this kind of jovially a joke. These no, are some no, no, serious no, no. people. No, this is serious shit. Yeah. And these people live their lives based on stealing yeah. packages. Yeah. yeah. They have a procedure, they have a means of communicating, they yeah. have a means of evading cameras, and my perspective is... Aside from waiting out there for them, or doing a variety of interactions, which ultimately puts me in physical I want inter- danger. I want to find out. Well, how do you actually- how do you encounter and interview them? They know where I live. Yeah, they can do anything that they want through this period. That's of right. Time. They can burn your fucking house exactly. down. Exactly. Molotov cocktails, the works. They could do anything they want. And they might too. Exactly. That's the thing. That's yeah. why. <laughs> I mean, as the days tick on, we feel slightly safer. Yeah, but my perspective is this is not a way I want to live my no, this life. This is not the kind of joke, you know. This exactly. is no, you know, no. This is serious shit. Exactly. You're right. I agree completely. And quite frankly, I've got better things to do with my time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, some people like that kind of shit, but not me, man. I I don't want that kind of crap in my life. Yes, and that's been the conclusion. So I don't think there'll be any more bait packages put out in the No, probably future. not a good idea. What I am going to do, What you could put out is a Christmas present for them. <laughs> but probably the bag lady would get it instead. I mean, well, what I've identified yeah. is that there are at least two groups, well, three if you count the original you could put it guy out who on was the, the sidewalk, neighbor. Make it, or put it out on the driveway somewhere where it's really easy up. for them to the get. Kids will pick that up. I mean, uh, okay. it, there are so many levels to this thing, and I realized yeah. that I was actually moving into a murky psychology that I have no business yeah. being a part no, of that wanna, I don't want to do. Unless you want to do that. You know, I mean, that's something to plenty, consider. Like I say, plenty, the idea of interviewing them but strikes But there are plenty of interviews with these kind of people I've never seen that. Avenue one. Vice has a whole thing on interviewing these kind of people in the UK. Really? It's oh. amazing the volume of stuff that they steal. Oh, okay. It's amazing oh. the money they make. Oh, okay. But I'm not interested in doing a Vice style documentary. No, it's just already been done. It's fine. I didn't yeah. know that. Okay, yeah. yeah. If it's been done, cool. Yeah. yeah. No point in doing it again. Exactly. You're right. <laughs> no insights had here. So I think that covers that topic. <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, again, I was just interested in, it doesn't cover it for me, because what I was interested in is what's going on in their language machines, day in and day out. They are constantly scanning for a place to get one up mm. on something. Mm. You know, I mean, that, that's their whole because life. Because the guy was walking with an umbrella that he had in his pack, that these guys probably spend all night out doing this stuff. Well, who? Well, I think they do it all. It's not just all night doing this stuff. I mean, their whole life is about this. Yeah. You know, and and everything that happens to them goes into that story they've got going in their head. Yeah. About who they are, about what they're doing, about what the world is all about. Yeah. And um, I say it would just be fascinating to talk to them. and find. I mean, I think I say I think I know what their story is to a large extent. But, yeah. But, I I think my level of fascination with regards to this is just having it stop. Well, I know you're looking at it from I I understand that. Yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah, and in fact, the fascination of it's going not as far stop. as well, I don't think it's I don't think that it's not going to stop. I think there's certainly there's certainly behaviours that I could have done that would have reduced this going forward. Well, yeah, if you want to live behind a fence, I mean, the, yeah, the, well, yeah, it depends on how you want to live. I guess it's that simple. Yeah. That that just strikes me as just well. I, I'd much rather have a fence than have bars on the windows. And if they start throwing bricks, then I'm going to have to put bars on the windows. Well, what, have you considered moving? Well, moving is an interesting process because moving requires you to have a place to go. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm just saying it that's, also that's requires to you consider. to. Um, well, without question, and that's certainly yeah. something that we've discussed. Yeah. But the modifications that we need to make in the short term, irrespective of whether we move ah, or not, yeah. would be a beneficial. Well, don't we put move packages on your front porch exactly. that attract it, people like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, right. Don't that, leave yeah. out shoes. Don't just don't leave anything out there. Yes. You got a bright light. You got a camera. Yeah. Two don't cameras. Don't have anything now. there. Exactly. That should solve the problem. Exactly. 
Or if you do put something there, no, you know, you probably better. I was saying, put it out of sight, but exactly, someone's going to look though. You know, no, someone's don't going even to put anything out exactly. there. Exactly. Exactly. They may look once, but they yeah. won't look again. And the people that do this professionally have ways of evading cameras. Or oh, they know what, yeah, they've mm. worked it out. Yeah. My main frustration through this is that if we had a competent police force, a lot of these things would be less an issue. Maybe. I and don't with know. the amount that I spend annually that goes to nominally the police force... The fact that they can't do patrols. But the, but the, the, well, that would help, I guess. But, I mean, these are issues that are bigger than police. These are fundamental social issues about dealing with economics and well, all sorts of shit. The way that it's always been addressed in the stuff that I've been a party to has related to what the money that is made in profit for spam versus the money <laughs> that is made in profit through stealing hubcaps. Which is roughly as lucrative as spam. <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> so you have to wonder how lucrative is it for these people to invest well, spam their is in better stealing than, packages? Well, spam is better than stealing shit off your porch. For well, this sure. is where it gets interesting. So yeah, eventually, let's go for spam. Let's eventually, eventually, they train them. They need retraining. <laughs> eventually, one would hope that stealing things off porches would get to the point where it just wasn't worth doing anymore. Yeah, yeah, that would be much better. Yeah, yeah, yeah they better go to spam. Well, we need to educate. They need re-education. They Without need to question. turn themselves in and get re-educated so how to do spam. But that's not going to happen. So, <laughs> in, the short so term, huh? in the short term, what you can do is you can put out packages with nothing in them, and they no, can no, keep no, taking no. packages with, with nothing them. in them. No, don't fuck with them. Just don't put anything That's up. exactly my point. But they're yeah. going to continue these behaviors unless there's some means for them. What? Well, just no one gets packages to well, the pr- anymore. Well, the problem is... The, like I say, the problem is more fundamental than that. Yeah, you know, it, it's a, it's our whole system is collapsing. This is just one of the symptoms. Certainly, and rather than this energy being channeled against, you know, against organizations that are causing this, this energy is channeled against individuals within a community. And I think that's one of my prime frustrations well, I think we need with to this. Energize ourselves around how we can create a system where this isn't going to happen. Without question. But while it's happening, you've got to deal with it. Well, happening while it's ha- as well. Yeah. Well, that's no. Well, actually, you don't actually have to deal with it. It's not. I mean, it's being dealt with and it doesn't work now. So, I mean, you can deal with it another way and it's still not going to work. Nothing is going to work until you redesign the system. You know, you can have a different semi solution. <laughs> And it'll have the things that work and the things that don't work. Mm. But it's not going to work. The neighborhoods and the cities around me that are slightly more affluent because they have people moving into them paying, which is what I'm doing and what at least four people on my street have done, is move here and are now paying far higher uh, county taxes than the people that have lived here for two, (laughs) three generations. Uh, should empower eventually a police force to actually act. In the we went with my work. Have you been to any city hall meetings? Well, the last city hall meeting, as I found out, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, was associated with using drones. The new thing that San Jose Police is considering is flying drones through communities. <laughs> well. Ah, interesting. Mm. Have they got a tank yet? Not yet. Not and yet. I'm sure okay. that's coming. <laughs> but reading this, this seems to be such a sufficient disc. Here's what I did do, Heron, which was actually productive. And let me tell you about this. There is a site called nextdoor.com. And nextdoor.com is a community site for communities all over, I think, the US only, where you sign up and by giving your address you're assigned your community and you can do things like post this kind of information which is what i did what's the the name of the place next door all one word n-e-x-t-d-o-o and and it's about people signing up who live in the same community and getting organized oh neat so i signed up for that and immediately posted to how many people did you find in your area a hundred out of two thousand possible a hundred yeah wow Wow, that's impressive. It's not particularly impressive at all. There should be for this kind of site uh, roughly, I would say, three or four times. The well, well, yeah, but uh, no, well, see, you're just not as appreciative as I am. Well, man. Here's where 100 it gets is a place to here's start. What's interesting is that the local police, the San Jose police, have used the crime section of Next Door 
as a means of putting out their PR, including this recent drones malarkey. And what I did is actually post the footage, plus the account of what occurred, plus also the footage of the woman stealing the shoes, to the crime section, which previously had only been comment communicated by San Jose police. And I made the point very clear that the police had... I communicated that I'd filed this with the police and the police had done nothing. And my perspective now is, is an independent community activist who tracks these kind of things and has camera footage, I can start putting in exactly the same information channel as the local police, what is actually going on. And to this, the community, which I pointed (coughs) out to my spiritual advisor is mainly women in their 30s and 40s who have gone on this site. They seem to be the prime demographic, at least in my area. Are these married women or single women? Married and single, but predominantly women, have been very appreciative associated with me posting this information, and I will continue to do so Mm -hmm. through this interface. So the question, of course, is how can you how can you organize people in a community, in a physical community, to make a difference? Yeah. Well, firstly, dissatisfaction and filing dissatisfaction in very clear quantities, I think, will at least change a narrative. Yeah, you can start a communication. Completely, yeah. completely yeah. governed by an ineffectual police force. Yeah, well, you can start a communication exactly. with the police. Exactly. That's right. That's right. You can start talking directly with the police. And every two weeks or every month that they log on to the site... They can well, realize that it's well, a place that they had historic exactly yeah. a place that they had historically used just to put out you, one-way press yeah. releases and now all of a sudden is now actually being back. exactly. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Yeah. That's a good idea. So yeah, so wraps up the shoe saga <laughs> for now, at least. Well, I think that's an awesome idea. I mean, yeah, to get the community organized. Yeah, but, but again, the, the, these problems are fundamental to our whole economic system. Well, here. you say that, but in actuality, we, I went with my work to Palo Alto today. Well, you can push them out of there to somewhere else. Exactly. But that is not going to solve the Plenty problem. Plenty of houses with packages out front with happy people waiting. Well, you can move these somewhere kind of else. Exactly. And that's what I did with Australia. And that's yeah. what's puzzling me here yeah. is that my community activist general stance will be used for a certain amount of time. But unless there are improvements in this in the next five years, I can't see myself staying in this area. God, you give, you're way more tolerant. I wouldn't. I would already be out of there. <laughs> I would say, whoops, mistake, <laughs> goodbye. Well, financially, that isn't always present, but as my oh, spiritual advice... Financially. It, it's uh, about your psychic space that you live in. Yeah, but I feel safe in my psychic space. Here. Do you really? Okay. Yeah. Well, like uh, I say, I'm just, I'm just talking about what I've seen from standing afar. So Yes. I, I mean, look, I'm considerably more militant in physical space than you may consider me vocally militant in podcast space. And my view is that if anyone were to try to enter this property in any kind of fashion, well, do but not see, imagine that, that, that I, I don't want to put myself in a position to have to make that kind well, of choice. Yes. Yeah, clearly, if that's the choice, I mean, I, I could kill somebody if I needed to. Yes. That's that's not a problem. Yes. It's just I don't want to put myself in this kind I of agree. place where I've got to make that decision. I agree in most part. And my feeling is, as I posted initially with this, that I was foolish to bait the community here. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Well, at least you understand that now instead of continuing to do it. It was that- You might put another one out there and say, sorry. <laughs> Here's 50 bucks. Leave us alone. Please. Go elsewhere. It's more lucrative in Palo Alto. Yeah, right. Here's 20 bucks. This is the last you're going to get from me. Yeah. Take and the actually, bus it's ride not to a Palo bad Alto. idea. I the like parcels that. are better there. <laughs> Through my friend's time here, as we've now named him Alex Brooks, there were a few prophetic experiences that occurred through this time. And what it made me realise is that a lot of the stuff that you and I discuss here is relatively intellectually abstract for me. (laughs) However, with my friend here, the discussion associated with medicinal cannabis kind of came to a head. We had a gathering here based on people that Alex had met while he was here. And through this, it turned out one of the gathering, one of the folks he'd met while he was here, had a medicinal cannabis prescription and produced his medicinal cannabis and smoked it with his wife and then 
my friend smoked some of this medicinal cannabis as well. And it made me realize that I actually hadn't been around people smoking cannabis for probably 15, if not 20 years. Oh, did you notice a significant change of some sort? It was extraordinary. In really? fact, the thing that made me realize, actually, this fellow's wife started speaking gibberish. I mean, I've been around people that have been stoned previously. I've never been around someone who was like this stoned. My spiritual advisor wasn't present, but I gave an account of this back to her where we both just looked at it because, I mean, my spiritual <laughs> advisor was a deadhead. She's seen all kinds of people stoned all the time. Yeah. We neither of us had ever experienced someone who lost, on a relative, what appeared to me at least, to be a relatively small quantity of cannabis. Yeah. To be almost completely unintelligible. (laughs) Yeah, you know, you just never know what's going on inside these language monkeys. It's scary as hell. That's why I stay to myself, man. They fucking scare me. Hmm. Because this happened on our front porch, I actually had video footage of it. But I was hesitant to record it. In fact, I, I recorded some of it. But not the part with the fellow's wife. Well, I hope, oh, I hope you would. I'd love to see some of this. No, it was actually slightly disturbing. I mean, because it was disturbing sufficiently. Well, that's, yeah. Yeah. It should be disturbing. Yeah. And then the fellow whose his wife was obviously knew that this had occurred and then kind of shepherded her away for the remainder of the evening. Was that like what she she usually does this? <laughs> you know, give her a Nothing little pot and she just like that. Starts but it was clear that he already knew that she just shouldn't be around other people in this state, basically. Yeah, well, some people probably shouldn't smoke grass. Yeah. Mm. No. But it was extraordinary to me because I'd completely... I mean, I guess I'd just completely disassociated the way most people use cannabis. In well, see, I, that's the thing for me. I yeah. mean, I don't know. It doesn't seem to do... It's so subtle for me, I'm not sure it's worth even doing. Mm. <laughs> you know? Mm. It, it's, uh, it certainly isn't psychedelic or in, in any way like it, like it was 30 mm. years ago. It's, it's, uh, it, like I say, it's so subtle, I'm not sure how much I'm doing or, or just what's going on here. Mm. But yeah, it was interesting to me, having had this experience with these people in my presence, I um, had a a prophetic dream associated with the fact that because none of this has played any part in my life for more than 20 years, but I have a friend who is still kind of amongst this culture, it's, yeah, it struck me that the decision... Which culture are we talking about? The cannabis culture, okay. the, you know... The, is there a cannabis culture? Well, there are many, but there is a means where people who, you know, smoke weed can find other people that smoke weed, irrespective of the medicinal status in California. There are, you know, hand signals, eye movements... Yeah, no, I understand. I'm just... In order to... I'm just thinking if the only thing they have in common is the fact that they smoke cannabis, then that ain't saying much. (laughs) Except through the periods of illegality and a wide variety of other things. Well, there's a there's a communal spirit associated with this, I think. Well, there, on some level, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah right. So the people people who are willing to go over that line, which yeah. other people see as uh, you know treacherous, and, yeah, yeah. yeah that, so that says something, yeah. Although probably some people grow up now. I mean, it's been so many years that people, some people just grow up in that culture, and that really isn't the line they. Well, certainly, they I mean, where I'm from, in Australia, cannabis has decrim- been crim- decriminalized for more than twenty years. Yeah, so that's. That's very and certainly different. the people were kind of initially a little weirded out that they were smoking weed yeah. in the presence of someone who wasn't smoking weed. And I just said, I come from a place where, you know, the stuff yeah. almost grows wild. Well, see, when I started smoking yeah. weed, it was illegal. You could exactly. go to jail yeah. for it. So it, th- that you said You can still something. in the state of California go to jail for cannabis. This whole medicinal stuff is just no, a No, I understand that. But, yeah. but uh, I mean, 1960 was just a very different world. Yeah. You know? But there was a period actually prior to Leary where, uh, or prior to a lot of the Well, nobody so, knew exactly. about it. It wasn't yeah. a problem then. It but was just an interesting. Of, um, the, I think it was uh, uh, Tommy Chong on Joe Rogan's podcast where he talked about that he could smoke cannabis pretty freely in the early 60s because no one knew what it was. <laughs> they just thought it was an exotic form of tobacco. Yeah. And, you know, 
just allowed it. Well, it, it, was, it wasn't an issue. Yeah. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> yes. Yes. Anyway, so I had a somewhat prophetic dream that led me to realize that things need to change considerably before I feel comfortable being a part of this community. And I think a lot of the stuff associated with... And which community is this we're talking about? Not in terms of the active participation in smoking cannabis, but even being around cannabis, maybe a caregiver Uh or anything like that, associated Uh with the general land race discussion as well. And that this community is still, even with a view of decriminalization through this medical legislation, is still something that is actively you know, pursued by... Well, the whole idea of of marijuana as a reason for existing is mm. ridiculous. Mm. You know, I mean, that's a particular interest. If you have an interest in that, fine, mm. you know, and that's about as far as it goes, mm. as far as I can see. Mm. I mean, just to join an organization of people who are, who think marijuana should be legal is... I mean, there's no commute. There isn't anything there. I mean, there's just... It's just a, this abstract idea. People, for all sorts of reasons, want that. Mm. The other experience that I had was going, again, in Palo Alto here, there's a familiar theme, was going to a book fair. Now, my friend Alex had a friend who he went to high school with who now works at Google. And having had him stay with us for about a week and a half, I thought, well, it might be an interesting excursion to go and meet the friend who I hadn't actually, well, maybe I'd met previously, but I don't have no recollection of meeting previously, who works at Google. So this fellow said, well, there's a book fair in a local community college. Why don't you come to that book fair and we'll meet there and, you know, yeah. chat and have a meal and this kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, cool. Sounds like fun. I, historically, and we've talked about this in previous Stone Apes, ha- enjoy books. I probably have too many of them. In fact, I acknowledge I have too many of them. And I probably purchase too many of them, and I also give away a vast number of what I purchase. But I do like still, because a large portion of the books that I own no longer or don't exist in a digital form, I like having the ability to read these books and reflect on why the information within them is important. Typically books from the 1950s back to the turn of last century, I like reading those kind of books on a variety of topics. Going to this book fair was some of the most extreme, almost drug-themed-like behaviour that really made me feel dirty. The book fair was held in a community college which was substantial. It felt like it was roughly a mile long. Uh, It's called the Foothills Community College in, I think, Palo Alto. And it's a substantial community college of about... 50 separate buildings plus a major theater plus tennis courts and these kind of things big deal it's a solid size college yeah anyway we arrived there at the front we didn't know where the book fair was we wandered for probably about half a mile up to some tennis courts and then we saw a fellow packing the back of his car with books packing the back of his car with books he had carried maybe five bags of books with him, so he realised he'd come from the book fair, and his car was already pretty well three-quarters full <laughs> of books. And he pointed out what was in the car was $110 worth. And wow. he then ran past us. He wasn't going to walk with us and talk with us. He ran past us <laughs> to get ahead of us to get in the book fair to That's right. his you bags might, again. Yeah. Yeah, damn right. And I have never, and he he <laughs> was one of many. Yeah. Who well, literally... See, there's an audience for everything. There's <laughs> a disturbed audience for well, a lot of stuff. Well, whatever. Whatever it is. If you've got something, if you can market it to the right people, they will come. <laughs> this was beyond people that were clearly readers. This was psychologically disorder hoarding kind of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are people. Yeah, for books, though. So not we, for other things, exactly, just for books. Exactly. So we passed yeah. We passed a Dodge style. You know the Dodge camper vans? They're larger than the VW camper vans. They're actually quite sizable camper vans. Yeah. Probably 14 feet long, if not yeah. maybe yeah. 15 to 20. Yeah. Big, big, big van. Camper yeah. vans. Completely packed with books. <laughs> riding low to the ground. Exactly. <laughs> this was the mentality of the people there, to the point where you got inside... And I wonder, what do you think they're going to do with them? I don't think they could read them. I don't think... The guy mentioned... Do you think they these, just fill their they houses happen, with It them? happens once a month, apparently. Well, I know, but what are they going to do with them? They sell them by the pound, or are no, they filling up their the house? The guy was saying, well, my grandchildren will read some of this, and I looked at the stuff that he was throwing into the car, His and I His grandchildren just, will read it right. <laughs> No, 
it, it was mental health issue. It was all mental yeah. health problems. No, it's o- yeah, yeah. It's clearly it's well, it's uh, OCD. It's more. Yes, it's the mo- it's it's the hoarding faculty of OCD. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I went into the main room, which wasn't the discount books. This was the more expensive books, and felt sick to my stomach. I saw educated, well dressed <laughs> people, literally like grabbing books and holding them under their bodies and scurrying around. And it made me feel <laughs> dirty. It made me feel like I own books, but I'm not like these Fruit Loops. Yeah. I mean, it really yeah. was very strange. Then I went into the discount book section, which was about, I don't know, 400 yards in another building. And that was more my section. I bought maybe three or four books. And then I saw it. Do you remember Heavy Metal Magazine? No. It was a basic... I didn't realise it was so heavily erotic. I mean, I guess I never owned any heavy metal magazines. But there was a small pile of six heavy metal magazines underneath a table. And the woman who was uh, collecting the money, collecting the fiend's money, said to me, Oh, there's someone left them there, but they might be coming back. So come back in an hour if you're interested and they might still be there. What I found was these people just huddling with their book piles, kind of piling books on the payments desk so they could go back and grab more books. (laughs) I mean, I just, it was obscene. You know, I'm looking at the books I've got now. I maybe yeah. have uh, less than 100 books yeah. plus a, a bunch of shit that I wrote, hand wrote yeah. stuff, you know. And I was thinking on the air night, you know, that if I could find electronic editions of those, I mean, there are some I can't probably, but if I could, I'd dump them in a heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah. So our listener, Rich Murphy, which is how he met Alex Brooks, actually delivered to me, I think, six wine case boxes full of books. Um, and I neatly... <laughs> when did this happen? This happened actually on the day that Alex arrived. He and Alex had a good long conversation. I mean, I think Alex is generally compatible with the Stone Ape listenership. I have put some of his audio um, in the Stone Ape feed periodically, but I've removed it because it doesn't really fit in with our general narrative. Uh, but certainly Rich Murphy and Alex got on like a house on fire. Uh, and, yeah, it was nice to have, you know, as I posted, I think, on Facebook, old friends talking with new friends. Yeah. But I do... Yeah, connections are, you never know yeah. what can come out of those connections, you know? I'm feeling actually genuinely positive associated with Next Door as a means of actually finding local. I mean, there's a woman at the end of our street who's uh, an assignment producer for the local NBC station who, funnily enough, were actually going to run the masked package thief until there was too many storm stories. Because yeah. they actually like the video footage. Um, yeah. but, so there are actually interesting professionals in the area that I don't think I should just Listen, narrowly... Anybody, discuss. not just... I mean, just anybody who's willing to to get involved, you know, who, who cares. <laughs> you know? So, yes, this, this... Anyway, concluding the book theme discussion, I think um, it's certainly something that chilled me. And made me think very heavily about my affiliation with paper. And then I just need to get rid of a good amount of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, uh, I'm, well, even like all my personal journals and things, I've already got those in PDF. So, you know, in some sense, I mean, I actually, when I look at them, I don't go look at the paper things. You know, they're there, but it's so much easier to, to look, you know, on the PDF. So we have a couple, well, maybe three or four listener-submitted topics. But before I get to those, I wanted to roll into a, an idea that I think fits in with some of the listener-submitted topics, but was something that just hit me sometime about a week ago. We talk periodically associated with the changing perceptions over time, in particular how you know broad societal claims are made associated with certain sections of time. But through this, particularly in the last century, the idea of the decade was an important length of time. Mm -hmm. And what you refer to as the 60s, which actually encompasses a good portion of the 70s in your own experience. Well, it depends on what you mean by the 60s. (laughs) Yeah, you're right. To me, it never made it to the 70s. It ended in like the 60s were really uh, 60 to 65 at the latest. The early 60s. Yes, the early 60s are very different in a variety of tones from what you attribute to. Yeah, then it went from there to disco or something, I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) But the thing that made me realize was that the this notion of the decade doesn't exist anymore. 
Uh, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, you're right. It may be, well, it still could be useful, but yeah, decade shit, that's ancient history now. Yeah, it seems almost like it's too large a unit of time to be well, meaningfully mapped onto well, everything. Well, I think it's still useful. It's just, uh, you just have to start thinking about those issues. I mean, decade isn't what it used to be, you know? A decade, uh, like I said, I expect to see a new world in three to five decades. Well, my perspective is we're already in a new world circumstance. It's just not ah. the new world that you oh, want Oh, well, yeah, have. yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're right. But Compar- the elimination of ideas like the decade are very yeah. important in this process. Because what had happened historically was that whole modes of thought had been condensed into this notion of the decade. Uh, uh. In particular, with regards to discarding modes of thought. Uh-huh. You know, as in, oh, that idea was so 1920s. Well, yeah. that idea was so well, 1960s. Well, it makes sense for a few decades. Well, that's where it gets interesting. <laughs> and then it didn't make any sense. Well, and then time speeded up. <laughs> so I want to float the idea that we're actually possibly post-decade now. Oh, I yes. I, I don't think that's too radical. And through that... Well, it's not that we're post-decade. It's just that... You know, time is speeding up, and that decades are still a useful concept in some t- in some ways. In what ways? Uh, Find, can you think off the top of your head a way that decades? Well, just the very fact that people thought in terms of decades almost forced things in. It's just an arbitrary. It's like inches. You know, an inch. What the fuck is an inch? It's but just the thing about an inch is it still it still has meaning as it's used in measurement and these. Well, so does a decade. It's ten trips around the sun. It's perfectly good, um, you know, time decimal time measure. But if it doesn't convey meaning the way measurement conveys meaning... No, 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 no. You're misconstruing what meaning is. It doesn't have any meaning. It's just a measurement. What does an inch mean? It doesn't mean shit. It's just that long. But it has an agreed-upon meaning, which has a usefulness. And a decade has an agreed-upon meaning. Ten years. But does it have a usefulness in the descriptive sense as the way we've used decades historically, particularly in the Well, I don't know about historically. I'm just saying it's one measure. That's all. Just, you can't misuse it. You can't can't reify the concept as though there really are ten-year groups or somehow. That's nonsense. But as a... Historically was the case. Well, then they're idiots. What can I say? This, this is not worth discussing, is it? Very good. <laughs> Moving on to the listener submitted questions then. The reason I read this, the decade conversation initially, and I did actually think of this prior to Joe the Drummer's question, but Joe the Drummer asks, I like hearing you talk about your interpretations of current affairs. ISIS and Ebola were the end of the oh. world a few weeks ago. <laughs> now they barely... Uh, now they are barely being mentioned in the press. How are these stories being used to manipulate the language monkeys? Oh, yeah. That's interesting. It's interesting how it does change so quickly. Mm. You know, I mean, just the very... Yeah, Ebola. <laughs> See, the thing is, I don't, I don't watch mass media. I look at mm. Google News maybe twice a day, mm. you know, and, and sort of scan through that. And usually I don't pay any attention to any of it. Mm. Once in a while, I'll see something that looks kind of interesting, but not very often. So, I mean, I've, I've historically used ISIS, and I've talked about this in our discussions, as a means of anal- analysis for really strong language monkey-style behavior. So <laughs> this week, although ISIS has had less of an importance in the media, some general came out and said, it's going to take us three years to get the Iraqi <laughs> army up to dealing with ISIS, <laughs> which just made me think that this man... Fire this fucker now. This guy should not have a job. Clearly, he doesn't understand any part of this discussion. Well, of course, that's probably what they told him to say. Getting a paycheck for the past 40 years, he doesn't have a clue, and he shouldn't be part of the discussion. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, my perspective, less so with the bowler, but more so with ISIS, is it's an amazing means of just... You know, cutting through all this nonsense, and it's surreal, actually. Well, you just can't believe anything you read anywhere. It's just you—you you really just have to adopt that that position that it's all a bunch of bullshit. You figure that out. Yeah. You know. I mean. Yeah. Anyway, this follows on perfectly to Joe the Drummer's second. Question. All these people who think they know what the fuck is going on. <laughs> Who, who are – is there anyone who's listening here who actually thinks you know what reality really is? I had What's this experience really with the package th- theft, actually. I thought to myself, 
clearly I need to be more Stonian in my perspective here and disregard any sense of wanting to know. Well, you don't have to disregard anything. You just encompass them all. They're all valid perspectives. Well, including the part that you, there are certain things that you will just never know. Well, that may be true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, tough shit. <laughs> anyway, well, there may be certain things that are unknowable in the sense that the question yeah. is a, really just a linguistic malfunction. Yeah. Joe the drummer continues. Is it possible to learn to Did discern? we answer his yes. other question? Yes, I think we did perfectly. What was that question? Uh, how are these stories being used to mm. manipulate the language monkeys? Yeah, okay, yeah. I think we covered that. Yeah. He's, he continues by saying, is it it's possible... It's bigger than that, though, because it's the whole mindset that controls the people who think they're manipulating us. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they are being manipulated by the grammar of their language, yeah. in a sense. Well, anyway, okay, go on. Is it possible to learn to discern the patterns in storytelling to figure out what the powerful actors are planning, or Mm. is the control matrix too complex for anyone (laughs) within it even to know what the plan is, or (laughs) even if there is one? (laughs) I love it. First of all, of course, obviously, it's not an either-or question. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, they could could all be true, and that sounds more reasonable to me. I can't disagree with that. I mean, I, yeah, my perspective. See, I don't, yeah. I'm sorry. I don't think anybody is in control. See, that's the thing. I think, I think Earth is in control. This is something, this is not something that humans are running a show. Well, there are people that believe that they're in control. Well, they can, be- well, they believe can believe whatever they want to believe. They can have whatever story they want. They I got a, a different number story. of other language monkeys that also follow their belief system in I, such a way well, that they have to all be yeah. taken into consideration. Yes, that's all. I mean, the feedback and all that stuff gets very complex and, and all sorts of things. Hmm. However, it doesn't change the situation that it's just their story. Hmm. So. It's yeah. the 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 issue is waking for significant for really all humans to actually wake up from the trance of language. I don't see any other solution. But we are under the. Sp- I'm sorry. I, I could allow you to rap at nauseum, but we never, have we have more listeners. Please don't. Questions. <laughs> I'll listen to Jim Jones writes. It'd be interesting to hear you expand on what Google has done to the internet search experience. And why Bing is now a better search engine. Let me just pause at that point. Because I argued, I've argued historically, that one should augment one's search experience with Bing, particularly associated with items that Google is being sued over. I don't, I think we're a long way away from perfection associated with internet search. So I certainly have never asserted that Bing is superior to Google. I think that they can both be used in a search ecosystem, but continuing. Yeah, yeah, Also, yeah. if you have any thoughts on whether all publicly funded scientific research should be open access or stay behind paywalls of the big publishers. <laughs> For example, there seems to be significantly less material on Google Scholar than two or three years ago. Yes, and I think basically... I... Look, I think all research should be open source. I think basically if you're paid by an academic institution that typically is paid by the tobacco lobby, then you should <laughs> actually put your research out there so it can be scrutinized at every Not level. Not just re- everything yes. should be free to everybody. Yes. All but the if time. You're, if you're nominally taking public money, then the prerequisite for you entertaining that source of funding should be that you provide this information for yeah, nothing. Yeah, this is there the pub- for the, pub- the big publications are a dying set of institutions. They're all in a kind yeah, of frenzy yeah. feed. It's all the changing, end. yeah. And, yeah, I, it can't move fast enough for me. I'm on the advisory board of the International Society of Artificial Life. I'm Actually, I can't be a member of the International Society of Artificial Life because I refuse to give MIT Press who you have to pay to in order to join that body, uh, any money because they had, didn't, they, I paid my money and they wouldn't get me the publication. And then after my money stopped, they said, we're not supplying you the publication that you couldn't access because we hadn't given you access to when you paid the money. So I paid the money to get something that I couldn't get and they wouldn't give it to me after I stopped paying the money. <laughs> well, that isn't a broken, sounds... stupid system. Moving on. I t- <laughs> Well, as long as they can fool people into playing that game, I well, guess academics, they can get away with academics, it. Academics, <laughs> I guess, just write checks 
they just write checks to these idiots. Yeah, I think a, you know, I think a lot of people do yeah. that. Really, you know, that's that's one of the things that poverty taught me is that I know where my money goes, and I think if you've never had to really think about it that much, hmm. then uh, it's easy to just uh, spend it and then have an opinion about it. Mm. <laughs> you know, pretty easy. Mm. I listen to Mike King, who I have a lot of time for. What's Emails his name? Question. Mike, Mike King. 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 Okay. King, as in king and country, king and I queen. I got it. Yes. Mike king. is one of the few people who put out the stone ape flyers associated with So Long Language Monkey. He did so <laughs> at his work. He's done a lot of bits and pieces to promote the podcast, and I'd like to say Mike a King. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yes. yes. Cool. So, did well, yes. He Mike. also came to us from Model Rail Radio. A much really? blind and uh, occasional, uh, you know, occasionally positively discussed audio resource that I also put some effort into. Listen, we all that. have our own individual forms of brain damage. Yes, our and, own particular and that does, disturbing has, proclivities. At, at whatever they may be, there's room for all of us. Yes. Mike King writes... In the last podcast that I listened to, there was a discussion about having a small, sustainable place that was somewhat off the beaten path, but still accessible enough for people to stop by for some period of time. I'd like to hear more about that mm -hmm. idea and the merits of Squish over virtual for that type of place. Mm -hmm. Can I start well, on this, Aaron, or do you want to start? Well, no. Um... Why don't you start? Well... It just strikes me that those are the que I don't have an answer for any of mm -hmm. those things. Uh, those are the quest. Those are the right questions, though. So I <laughs> and of course I have yeah. thought about them. Yeah. But 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 those questions are precisely the questions we need to be asking. How do we want to structure it? I've experienced this recently because my friend Alex Brooks came through, and primarily this was to experience this kind of environment. What I learned through this experience was that it's relatively difficult to maintain a workaday job and have people coming through like this. It needs to be at a point where I am self-sustained in such a fashion that I can actually interact with the people that come through. Well, it, it depends on what you're trying to well, do. Well, it does work. It does work kind of occasionally, and it certainly worked with my friend. Well, it Alex worked the way it certain, worked now. Exactly. It worked However, fine. Well, you well you not as here. good as not as the way you actually you like it here, to work. So you might claim that worked fine, but I would say <laughs> well, it worked for what you could do. There certainly was a series of factors, including a degree of guilt on my part, that my workaday life had to, in these circumstances, dominate. Um, and I would have liked to have done things slightly differently, but unfortunately didn't have the luxury of doing that. My aim for the future is not to be in that I don't see any need to apologize for any of that. Uh, I mean, what I'm describing here is that it was just suboptimal, and that in, in moving towards something But it's always suboptimal. It will never not be suboptimal. Yes, but you can work to improve what well, is No, you're damn right. You can, you can get tired of wasting your time doing shit you don't want to do. <laughs> Amongst other things. <laughs> or you could yeah. just frame the fact that when you create this space, or in the process of creating the space, you just acknowledge this as a kind of point along the line, which says if you want this to start what I, optimizing yeah. Yeah. in the future to have a better space, a better functional environment. And curiously enough, before I got on this recording, I got an email from my friend Bruce Damer, who's doing an open house tomorrow evening at his particular space, including showing the Timothy Leary Library, imploring me to stop by for a visit. The problem is, funnily enough, that I have another community, Model Rail Radio, and I will be recording tomorrow evening this very community, so I'm going to write a very polite but yeah. apologetic email to Bruce Dover saying, we will get together quite strangely on the 100th recording of Model Rail Radio, probably because I will be in his area, um, because previously mentioned listener Rich Murphy, a participant in both Model Rail Radio and uh, at least in the discourse of Stone Ape, lives in that area as well, so I'll be able to go from Rich Murphy's to Bruce Damer's quite comfortably and back to Rich Murphy's, because they're doing wine tasting, which Rich Murphy, amongst other things, uh, is a, a, what would you want to call it? He, he makes wine, basically. So, yeah. A wino. <laughs> well, he presented his books in, in wine boxes, and it's all perfectly coherent, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> However, I don't drink, so I might go and spend time with Bruce Damer. But I'm certainly going to email Bruce Damer and say, look, we need to get together. I have a space. Why don't you come to my space at some stage? And I will make efforts to go to your space. But my space is still here and maybe just as interesting and as valid a space for you to um, interact with and participate in. 
So anyway, yeah, the perils of having this kind of space, in particular trying to bring people into this space, is mm. something that I appreciate and something that... Bruce you're, and again, you're talking about facing. squish, not... Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. yeah, that's a whole different yeah. thing. I've, I've given a little thought to that because this whole idea of starting a monastery and having a center mm. uh, devoted to gendo or whatever well we've talked about i mean we talked about this in the last recording because i think the quality of my squish squish relationships are different not better not worse but different no no it's quality of my matrix relationships yeah oh yeah obviously yeah that's a whole different world Uh, it's got its own rules its own ways of yeah absolutely and more importantly i both valid they're equally valid both with their own flaws, though. Both with their own. Well, they're yeah. they're good at some things and better at other things. Yes. And uh, yeah, th- I I don't see it as an either or thing. I mean, they I do yoga in squish. <laughs> it doesn't. I can't imagine any other way of doing it. Mm. <laughs> Although there are plenty of pr- practitioners that are now advocating yoga in the matrix. <laughs> Well, that's a very different kind of yoga than I'm thinking of. Well, it need not be. <laughs> Well, no, it need be, yes. Well, that, anyway. I mean, seriously, that's not – there. those are – ah, this is interesting. Those are two different universes, and they are both valid. Squish. Doing yoga in Squish, is there any way that – well, no, eventually it might be doable in the Matrix, but it certainly isn't right now. But it well, might be at some point. That, You're right. The people that do it in the Matrix currently do it – with um, shared, like, audio elements. Well, but they're still doing the postures physically in their body, right? Well, potentially they could be doing different postures at different times, potentially, at well, the same time. Well, no, it doesn't really mean yours. I'm just talking about is the person, in fact, using their physical body to to do the postures, the yoga positions, asanas. But if it's being communicated through electronically and if they perhaps close their eyes or do things... Uh, so they remove themselves. If what's being element. communicated electronically? Well, if they have, for example, a shared Google Hangout or Skype call that is labeling shared. No, but what I'm talking about. No, what I'm talking about is whether they are bending their bodies in the positions of a yoga asana yeah. or not. Yes, that's but, what counts. The rest is so yoga is not story. a community exercise, as far as you're concerned. I'm sorry. What? Yoga cannot be performed. Oh as a no, it could be, exercise. but that's no, that's fine. You, that's I don't know. Talking about. It. I'm just saying if you're that yoga is about doing the postures. If you're doing it alone, or whether you're doing it with a thousand other people, it's still about doing the postures. Mm. But when Physically. you do it by yourself, it's a different thing. Doing it with a community. Oh yeah, I'm sure it's different. And if every, the community well, even, exists electronically, even then it has some matrix that, component. Yeah, so. no, I have no problem with that. No, clearly every every day yoga is different. Not is you know from one day to the next. It's not the same from one minute to the next. It's it's what it is each moment. And uh, if there are other people involved in it, then that's going to change it, and that's fine. But like I say, if if you're not f- to talk about doing yoga without actually bending your body, then I would say you're not doing yoga. No, that's like, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're in agreement here. Yeah, all the other stuff uh, yeah, just adds some interest to it, though, for sure, yeah. So normally, particularly to the new listeners, we may move into a space of just general rapping at this stage because I have concluded my written commentary. In fact, I have one last thing to discuss here. Oh, good. So, somehow, my spiritual advisor and I came to a discussion maybe six to eight weeks ago associated with how sexuality in cinema has changed. And it's changed in large part due to the religious right moving into the censorship office in the U.S., which is pretty well documented. Netflix did a pretty groundbreaking documentary on this in the... Now I'm almost giggling at this. In the latter part of last decade. And they (laughs) produced an interesting account that showed that things like the rise of PG-13 as, you know, being something desirable for filmmakers (laughs) meant that um, a wide variety of violence could be included, but virtually no sexuality could be included. You know, know, it's interesting, the language, when I, when I, I do play movies occasionally, and it says it's rated something, something for 
language. Mm. <laughs> and then they what kind of language? It's just rated for language. Well, it can be for both things. It typically, <laughs> well, sometimes it says for course language. But what's interesting is that the, uh, certain language concepts can also push that rating. It isn't just for course language in all circumstances. Well, it's well, just, well, I've never heard, I have never yet seen one that said for course language. Oh, maybe that's something in the UK and Australia then. Maybe I've never seen it. Anyway. It just says for language so, or for drug use or mm. for violence or something, but it just says for language. Through this censorship body and the notion of what PG-13 meant in terms of the addition of violence, but the lack of ability to add any sexuality. Mm -hmm. What you find also is displays of sexuality, which will always get an R rating. <laughs> yeah. But also it, that displays it, of sexuality are threatened to move into NC-17 and then potentially even X rating. <laughs> yeah. Is the fact that the only way that sex can now be shown in cinema, or at least the easiest way to avoid censorship, is by juxtaposing sex and violence. And what you actually find is a continuation of shots of sex and violence in close proximity to one another. Really? Interstitially. Why is that? I don't understand. Because What's... if you had pure sex, it would be counted as titillation by these religious uh -huh. nuts. Yeah. And then okay. it would move into an X rating, which no yeah. person would right. create yeah, right. cinema. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I understand. Do. Yeah. But, but so how does, so they end up with what kind of a rating? They end up with an R rating if they put sex and violence together. Or oh, okay, if, put, if oh, okay, so if that's they put okay. Sex I got it. interstitially is just other subject yeah, right. Okay, topic. yeah, as long as they mix yeah. it with anything but yeah. sex. Yeah, so yeah. you can never it see could be sex and carrot top potentially. <laughs> that that okay. is exactly. You might even get a PG thirteen rating with sex and carrot top <laughs> because it's so completely removed. Yeah, anyway. yeah, you're right. That would counterbalance exactly. It. But whenever you have, and I made this point. To my wife, that whenever you have the female or the male form, you will never see it for more than about 30 seconds if it is used in these circumstances. Ah, Foreign okay. films, yeah. they get they're allowed longer periods because they don't have the same Who ridiculous the fuck laws. Cares? Because it actually fundamentally changes cinema form. And I actually think it's really disgusting. That sex co has to be combined. Well, it doesn't to have blended. to be combined. That's just because of economics. People can make any fucking movie they want to. But it will never be shown. Well, that's another issue. But the thing the is, purpose they want of creating a. Look, you're right. Thousands, tens of thousands of film students. Things go on YouTube. Millions of, millions of people exactly. see stuff on YouTube. However, so fuck those people. You can make any goddamn thing you want. If it has sex, you're far less likely for it to be seen through YouTube. Well, so you deal with what you got to deal with. Let's work to change that. So sometime in the near future, I'm going to be interviewing Joe Hansen. I've got to get at least Joe's straight. Joe Hansen, I described a couple of recordings ago, filmed a what I re referred to as the kind of meth version of Burning Man, but what's called the Gathering of Juggalos, where a group of people in the Midwest get together and listen to really bad white rap music and drink a lot of beer and camp out basically for three or four days. He produced something on YouTube that was um, heavily censored because there's a lot of nudity and a lot of drunkenness, but mainly the nudity he censored in order to get his footage onto YouTube. Yeah. The way in which I am getting a recording with Joe Hansen <laughs> is that I put money into his Kickstarter in order to have a Skype call with him. Yeah. And, but also, if you put any money into the Kickstarter, you also get the Gathering of Juggalos Uncensored, or what he calls the Gathering of Juggalos Triple X, which basically <laughs> is, I think, about four minutes worth of video, which is. <sighs> Almost all female nudity, but actually yeah. it's really disturbed female nudity. <laughs> yeah. And in watching it, I realised that this was very visually not what exists in contemporary cinema because of the discussion I had with my spiritual <laughs> advisor two <laughs> months ago. There's a reason the for that. The sex and violence. <laughs> but this is actually just a lot of kind of gratuitous nudity. And I mean, no, the this is appropriate the, for the internet. Well, that's this is inter interesting. This is just perfect for the internet. You probably wouldn't want to make a theatrical release out of it, but... I mean, know. I was looking at it and I was thinking, where... This is not eroticism. Where does this actually fit 
this is almost kind of, I mean, it's similar to, you know, animal pornography in some <laughs> regard. Like, well, yeah, is, it's just in that ballpark somewhere. Yeah. You know, you don't need to micromanage it. Uh, manage it. It's just, but it's in there. It struck me visually as a form where, in looking at it and realizing that I was looking at it because I paid for his Kickstarter, I thought, this <laughs> is really very bizarre to me visually. Yeah. Yeah. This is just a series of clips of nude women doing a variety of things at this gathering of jugglers. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, you know, it's, it's amazing to me. Yeah, the whole porn thing, you know, or on the internet is apparent. I don't, I, do you know what the figures are? Someone, I, I don't, it seems to me I've heard some really outrageous figures that pornography and female, you know, or any kind of people, webcams and shit, takes up something like 50% of the entire internet no, spectrum. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. That's okay. bullshit because the, the numbers that I hear. Netflix so, takes up 50% Netflix of it. Netflix takes up 65%. 65? Yeah. Okay, so they only take up maybe 20 or 30% YouTube of YouTube takes up a good portion more of that. Oh, pornography, yeah. oh, pornography yeah. I think, is actually dropping off. The statistics that I see associated are with people pornography. getting bored with it finally. I think the thing about it, is, I don't know. I mean, I honestly don't know. I it always struck me as strange that there were still porn stores. <laughs> yeah, really. Why you know? would you go out there? Well, unless you just get off on porn stores. Yeah, <laughs> that's their thing. Yeah. yeah, but I don't know. I mean, I <laughs> my perspective associated with internet pornography, as you say, is comes from these statistics that you occasionally hear. But I've heard that, uh, I mean, other things take more money in the porn does, and certainly in terms of internet traffic, there seems to be more non-porn traffic than there is porn-related traffic. I yeah. mean, the argument yeah. was always that porn, you know, motivated the development of the VHS and the development of the <laughs> well, internet. Well, it was certainly part of stuff. Yes. You know, I mean, it's certainly yeah. part of the, of the program here, yeah. But I think we're probably, it's a post, I mean, they're now saying all this Oculus Rift stuff and people will start <laughs> watching in 3D. Uh, have I told you my story about the 3D pornographer in Australia? <laughs> no. I, I think I have historically. Well, if you did, you I probably forgot forgotten forgotten so. about it. <laughs> yeah, the fellow's name was, I can't even think of the guy's name. He went under, a, Ross Stokel was his name, and he goes still under that name. He um, worked in a VR installation that I was nominally like a team leader in. And his big thing was um, barely legal 3D porn. So he would bring in a series of like gymnasts and athletes and get them to strip down to next to nothing and then film them doing cartwheels. And then he'd go yeah. out to, and film yeah. them. And some of his stuff... What year did, was this? 98, 99. Okay, yeah, yeah. He had an aura about him so for example my father once came by the shed where i lived and he said to me just by looking at this guy's car that's that internet porn guy isn't it and i said yes there was an incident actually i mean people who are familiar with stone ape might remember the rapping noble ape the lip syncing the woman who did the lip syncing for the ape her car broke down at one stage and i went out in ross stokel's car to pick her up. She was a kind of Polish Catholic woman, relatively conservative. And I realized I was picking her up in the porn mobile, which was completely packed with porn. <laughs> so we pulled up and I had to get in the back and literally thrust all the pornography under the seats, try to make sure she didn't look in the back of the car while I was in the back of the car. Like almost lean forward. In yeah, your... right. You put your head right up between the exactly, two. Exactly. Yeah, between the perfect. two things and yeah. just make sure She'll... Ross Stokel yeah. stuff... Funnily enough, um, well, I've already, I've, I've recounted the story associated with how my three week tour became a three month tour associated with this, but this is, this is for the hardcore who want to go back and look through the Stone Ape archive, so I don't need to expand anymore on this. But yeah, so this character made me realize that pornographers are pretty, like, greasy characters anyway, and the 3D pornographers are very, very curious. Well, I remember even back in the very earliest day, because I started with the, the original Mac, mm -hmm. and even in the original Mac, there were these little like, sort of like GIF things. Mm. <laughs> now, we've talked about Mac Playmate historically as well. well okay, Mac yeah, right. We talked about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's just laughable yeah. how no matter what the medium is, 
that shows up, mm. <laughs> you know, and I guess the state of the art must be getting somewhat better, but still, I mean, again, there's just live cam stuff going on. So mm -hmm. what else can you do? I mean, is there anywhere else to go with a computer? I mean, 3D, I guess, would... I, the thing that strikes me is just that it, there are so many subdivisions of particular proclivities and particular ideas that it really is very, very strange. I mean, well, I... Well, but those are a really separate issue, though. You're right. Uh, there's all sorts of people into all sorts of things, but still, you're looking at a fucking screen. Mm hmm I mean, unless there's a way to actually get beyond, like, say, 3D, uh, you know, or fully immersive matrix. See, that's the thing. is That's why I'm holding out is it in the long well, run. I did a documentary, which I actually didn't watch. I didn't even see the short of it. Well, in fact, I think I might have seen the short, but I didn't watch the full length thing that talked about all these kind of servo controlled immersion things that basically strap onto your body yeah well, all this other yeah. kinds of stuff i mean yeah. i think basically the state of the art but well I, now it, no it's completely out of the question now but i mean in the future if you, it would have to be just direct to the brain stimulation yeah. somehow and you know i mean that's in the future maybe but that's what i'm talking about is at that point then you can talk about doing yoga <laughs> <laughs> without bending your squishy body yes yes but uh that's that's a way off still i'm afraid <laughs> is that just unreasonable on its face or is that something that is certainly a reasonable possibility my concern i mean i've known well actually that's not true i've never known people in my presence but i've heard accounts of people that have tried to wire aspects of their brain. I mean, although I cut this audio for a variety of reasons, you talked relatively positively associated with kind of point of contact. I don't know what one would even call them. Wires basically touching points of the scalp that could then induce electrical currents to do, you know, various things. I mean, the most extreme cases that I've heard was when I was at college 20 years ago, of computer science students that cut into their skulls. And, See, I don't know, think the technology is the issue. I, I have no idea how it might be implemented. I expect it would be something that's unimaginable by us now, just like the stuff we're doing now was unimaginable by the people in 1900. <laughs> and, and so the issue is more of a philosophical issue, or not philosophical, but just at, – well, I'm not at quite sure. Level, at some level, we have an implicit understanding that technology moves far faster than our bodies. And we get this yeah. through, well, iOS, Android updates. We get this through computer updates. We get well, yeah. I mean, when I think back to the first yeah. Macintosh, again, the first, yeah. you know, the Mac Playmate or whatever. Yeah, I, would, I would be hesitant to put anything technological into my body that I couldn't replace at the same frequency that I can replace my iPhone. And that's, I guess, where the concern yeah, comes yeah. through, that well, anything yeah. that you put into your body will be almost sure obsolete Well, that's two the thing years. is that that's just going to be a, so a hardware thing that's going to get put in your body. And that it may be that that gets to the point where it's actually fast enough to deal with anything we need to do, and then the rest is handled in software. Mm. Maybe. Well, I, mean, I mean, why not? Why couldn't it just be... Because a, even in, in any aspect of hardware, it's actually the improvements of hardware not that yeah. drive software some of the time. No, but that's what I'm saying is that we may reach a point where we may not need any more improvements in hardware. That we may have hardware that's adequate to any possible demand we could, we could ever make. I can't imagine that in my life. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's I mean, I know you have periodically well, said screens are getting limited. and Well, no, that's an interesting question. I mean, because to me, that seems like almost inevitable. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? That for many people, this seems to be inevitable. I'm astonished at the complexity and the addition of complexity that I see within my own industry. I mean, I can't yeah. anticipate there being any slowdown with regards to you know, mass cloud supercomputing in the foreseeable future. There are no bottlenecks that I have seen so far, and there's certainly no shortage of an increase in complexity. All the naysayers that talk about this in popular no, But culture, what about hardware, though? I mean, where, well, where's... What's, what's happened with hardware is just that the models associated Nothing's with happened hardware. with hardware. Heron. Come on. I mean, I mean, it's getting better incrementally, but... No, but it... even the use of hardware, if you look at the way cloud computing 
uses not only concurrency, but n uses um, uh, ideas uh, of reactive programming, of distributed reactive programming. Well, that's programming, the whole issue. Is that we're, it seems to me we're already, in a sense, at a place where there's enough computing, there's more than enough computing power than I could ever use. I've, I don't need any faster computer than I already have. Well, you say that, but you really like your new iMac. That's no, I, no, you're right. You're, you're right. you're right. But the point is, is that ninety, what ninety five, ninety nine percent of the computing power of the world is just sitting idle at this moment. I don't think that that's necessarily the case anymore. I mean, I think historically that was the case, and so okay, so it's only seventy five percent now. I agree that there's a wasted amount of processing, but I think within the processing that is being used, there's an ever-increasing efficiency, there's an ever-increasing use of redundancy yeah. and a variety of yeah. other methods well, to well, actually what, improve this. That's what, sort of what I'm saying. Is that but I, the bottleneck I, that everyone yeah. claims, which is associated with not the computation, but with associated with human perception well, that's and ability issue. to understand, yeah. Yeah, which well, always that, seems to be what is thrust out when people start talking about it. Well, well of course, but that's, that's, yeah. but that's not a computer issue. That's a separate issue. But I think, I think both of these are, are straw or androids, for want of a better term, and neither of them actually are the case. What's particularly fascinating is, in fact, the opposite is the case. And what would be more interesting, particularly for these popular authors to start to do, is actually to come into companies, and some of companies more than others, I mean, certainly the company I work for has a very open, you know, series of computing initiatives, particularly associated with cloud computing. And, you know, the likes of uh, Lanier et al., um, you know, your buddy Ray Kay and various other folk. I mean, hopefully, although we probably can't talk about what's going on at Google, hopefully the stuff Ray Kay is seeing at Google's changing his perspective in this light. But, you know, there's so much stuff going on that these popular authors never actually get any... Well, they don't even want to interact because it goes against who, the stuff Who are these saying. popular authors that you're talking about? I have no idea well, what you're referring Ray to. Ray well historically written about computation in a particular life. Okay, okay. Jeremy yeah, okay. Lanier, who I haven't talked with you about, but I've, well, I've talked to you about No, well, I, mean, I know who he you know, is anyway, You know, there vaguely, are these kind of yeah. authors that write these treaties associated with, you know, the limits or the direction of processing and computation, and from everything that I see, they're very, and out of step in completely the opposite way that most people will perceive are in fact completely underestimating the power and the extended power of computing, in particular what has already occurred, but what will continue to occur over at least foreseeably the next couple of decades. Well, but see, that's exactly what I'm thinking too, is that in, in, in a sense, the limits now are really our own ability to think, which exactly. basically well, we well, are so fucking no, stupid. No, 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 let's, let's, that, I don't that, think that's actually... Well, you're right. In a popular sense, we, we have more power available sense. to us than yeah. we even know what the fuck to do with. But trust me when I say that the technically brilliant minds that are looking at these problems are not naive to that. The popular consciousness is naive to that. But the technically competent people that are in these spaces are not only not naive to this, they are creating solutions that huh? require technical investment in order to Get understand those people it. onto this podcast. <sighs> Well, one of these individuals, the problem is that they are, they are, as one might imagine, also slightly curious people <laughs> in terms of reaching out to a popular sense. But no, I mean, I'm relatively close with one fellow at Netflix who I think could easily be part of this. But to point out how interesting this fellow is, you have to take a 20 question exam before you can even talk to him. <laughs> in fact, when my wife went to no, an I've, office party in LA, myself. I've actually considered that myself. Well, this guy's this guy's been living the dream for the past three years at Netflix. Before I, you can yeah, talk to him, you have to, yeah. to take a twenty question I'll, exam. Well, you wouldn't you pass, Heron. Send me. Uh, pardon me. I don't think you'd pass. Oh, we'll see. It's a programming related exam that requires you to understand reactive programming. Okay, uh, I'll I'll try. We'll see. <laughs> you got a you got a URL? Send it to me. I'll ask him if he'd be sympathetic to do. No, 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 no. Just I'll listen. I'll respond. Uh, however, I respond to it, he'll see it, I guess, and decide whether he need, he thinks he should contact me or not. It's his well, business. If you don't pass the exam, he will not communicate with you. Sorry. 
anyway. Okay, well, so he's looking for – he's not just looking in general for somebody interesting. He's looking specifically for somebody he wants to hire or no, something? No, no, he's looking for people who will respect him at a particular level. I mean, I appreciate why he does it. I find it very curious. No, no, no but he's, he's just defining that level. He's interested yeah. in programmers, not just – well, you know, he's interested think, in particular kinds of programmer that think yeah. in a particular kind of. Oh, no, I understand. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. yeah, my field of interest is a little broader than that. <laughs> I can certainly put it to him. I can point you to. I mean, he's got plenty of well, public talks that he's put online, yeah. but they are all relating to his particular. Yeah, area. no, he may, I may have no business yeah. together. He's may, he knows. You know, I'm interested in language. He may be interested in what it is he's interested in, and there may not be much overlap. The there. thing that I found was that was curious through my interactions with him has been how tight his area of knowledge is. So, I mean, for example, I think that most people that are in this space should have a general knowledge of uh, aspects of graphics and a variety of other technologies that I think kind of broadly define what I consider to be computer science, for want of a better term. And the thing that I found interesting is that he doesn't know about these various areas. So he requires through his exam a very tight knowledge in a specific area but he doesn't seem to himself have a plurality of knowledge outside that area. Mm -hmm. Could be interesting. Well, anyway. you know, every yeah, you know, I I've got a wide range of experience in some areas. I mean, it's narrow compared to some people, mm -hmm. and it's wide compared to other. You know, it's just each of us, I guess, has to figure out what we're interested in. Mm. <laughs> so, I think I'm out of topics. I know I'm almost out of voice. And because we went out to the office, as you did in our last recording, where you had to eat some greasy pizza, we went out to a New Orleans-themed restaurant, which was, from my perspective at least, extraordinarily salty, which has its mm, own squish-related yeah. effect. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm feeling like this recording probably can conclude at this point. Um, and yeah, I, I think we're back to the regular frequency. I mean, I'm not doing anything through the holiday period that would get me out of the area. So. Oh, you never know what's going to happen, though. Well, in particularly, <laughs> I never know what's going to happen with you if you're going out to the desert and sleeping and under the stars. Well, that's just for well, that's right. If I don't come back, if I don't show up next week, then have them, you know, send them out. I'll be at Jumbo Rocks. Very good. Or Jumbo Rock, I guess it is. Okay. Camp, Jumbo Rock Campground at uh, in Joshua Tree National park okay and <laughs> you're going out for saturday sunday i'm leaving tomorrow morning saturday morning mm -hmm. sometime and i'll be uh spending the night out there okay and waking up on the new year and the new moon at the same time okay and i will stop at a restaurant called cns uh, restaurant and have uh, an omelet with their special salsa very good. <laughs> and uh, if they're still, you, are you aware that they're still in business? I mean, you haven't been doing this for a few years. Um, we'll, we'll see. Or you'll find some. They've other been there place. for a long time. Fair enough. <laughs> many we'll have see. fallen, and there aren't that many places to go out there. So, so what you're saying is that I should ping you probably either on Monday evening or Tuesday morning just oh, to confirm, or what, no, what should I, I do? No, I should be back. Um, let's see, sun, I should be back Sunday evening. Okay. And yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, wait for the yeah. photos, and we'll take it from there. I don't know what I'm going to do this time. It's been a couple of years since I've been out there. Yeah. So you don't think you'll take photos? Well, I may or I may not. I mm -hmm. I don't have any plan to particularly. Okay. Well, I'll wait for the general Facebook well, activity, well, and if I don't see the general Facebook activity, there, yeah, there may be none. Who knows? Communicate accordingly. <laughs> And if I don't get communication from you, I will pass this information on to the relevant. Authority. Well, I assume, and you know, one time out there, I actually passed out. Yeah. And, and fell down and I mean, it was out for like, I don't know, I don't know how many seconds, but I came to. And I was thinking if I'd been out for 10 seconds, I mean, I might have easily have fallen into the fire instead of next to the fire. Mm. And um, and that really got me to thinking. Mm. <laughs> you know? yeah, I periodically have those kind of events in my life, but I'll certainly keep that in mind and I'll be sure to ping you. Yeah, Monday. yeah, yeah. Whenever you pass out, don't fall into the fire. Yes. That's an important uh, rule to have. Yes. Go. It's surprising, actually, how quickly you cook. <laughs> Faster yeah. than you might think. A few seconds would be very unpleasant. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Scary. It's scary to even think about it. And at the time, 
You know, if you ever had one of those uh, moments of, I guess it's just low blood pressure, where where you've been sitting for a while and then mm. you stand up too yep. fast and you get dizzy. Certainly. Well, that was what happened to me. Except this time, I actually passed out. Mm. And the benefit, the fire also creates that effect as well because your blood flow is completely different. Your upper half is warm, and your lower half might not be as warm as the upper half. So, that um, yeah, who knows? Additional... Yeah. Well, this was out at this, this happened out at Joshua Tree. Yeah. Uh, you know, with a big sitting there next to the big fire. <laughs> Aaron, I'm really looking forward to talking to you next week. I'm assuming that you will be perfectly fine through this experience. Let's hope so. I'm looking forward to hearing any insights that this adventure No, man, now the pressure is on. Definitely. Okay, all right. Oh, and before I conclude this, for any folks who are coming from the Drunken Taoist podcast, ah, the, get the, in contact the, with Dallas. me. Get, we have a Facebook page, which is relatively active. Make yourselves known that you've come over from the Drunken Dallas podcast because this would encourage me to pay out for another month. And if I don't hear from you guys, I may not. Well, you may but, not have to pay out for another month. Maybe you have already got all the inquisitive, well, interesting let's see. ones. Let's see. You well, know, if let's you have to do it twice, then you're going to be getting the sluggards. You know, yes. the second, the second. You know, what we want second is batch. the prime guys, exactly. and that's what we've already got. If you're here, <laughs> if you're if you're here, <laughs> and you are in tune enough to figure out just how cool this really is. <laughs> yeah. If you survive this long, you'll probably enjoy it. Don't you? Oh, man. Who knows what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> Aaron, have fun out in the desert. I look forward to chatting in a week's time. Take okay. Care. Good night. <laughs>